Um, uh, I would like to speak about an incident like that is now about 30 years ago. And it was in my hometown, Berlin. I grew up in Eastern Berlin, like where the wall collapsed. And I was not privileged enough to see ever again something that is so radical and so brutal, at the same time so peaceful. However, I also didn't really care because I was a child and I was just into magic. And it's really hard to understand what magic is because um, it is that thing that we can't understand by definition, which then defines magic. Well, that sounds even more stupid. So I invented yesterday uh, in my hotel a little formula and it goes like this. So um, magic is something that doesn't necessarily needs to be something that you need to believe in. Or everything you need to know is that there's all thoughts and then there's something that you believe is objectively true. That's knowledge. And if you subtract all thoughts um, by the things you truly know, then you have the rest. That's that black hole there. And that hole is forever there, no matter if you believe in stock market, because that's just belief, not knowing, or God. It is just something that has to exist by definition of the opposite of knowledge. Now, what was the magic that I fell in love with 30 years ago was this one. Now, the magic about this is the travesty of one thing promising to be another thing. So when I was introduced to machines, my mother was a coder and she taught me to code because she thought that's the future. And she thought that might be for me helpful to understand and to organize my thoughts. Because for her, algorithms was the idea of an organized thought. Now, that was not really interesting to me. I couldn't believe that this dead machine somehow was able to produce characters and colors that looked so vivid to me. I remember having my first pocket calculator a little too late growing up in Eastern Germany, and it had that solar panel. And whenever I pushed my finger on it, the numbers slowly started to fade. And I didn't saw some battery not being charged. I saw something, someone drowning. And if you put it up your finger, it came back grasping for air. That is what I always believed. I believed there is something inside there and there could be life inside. And that would be a travesty of one thing becoming the other. The other travesty that I was always a little attached to is the opposite. It is the idea that there is something uh, so alive, let's take myself right now, and it stands here and it acts free in space and all of a sudden you all life is gone whenever humans try to be machines. So I tried to become a robot dancer and did this a lot on the streets of Berlin and then people were impressed and said, well, you can also do it in our clubs and for free drinks. And I thought like, I made it. So that was the most sustainable business I ever saw. And then people in theater said, well, you can come over to our theater, so you're now an artist and we start to sit down while you move. And then Hollywood called and said, well, we need somehow a bad guy that can dance. He must be from Germany. And as I was the only white guy that looks German somehow, I got the job. But, and then 20 years later, I woke up somehow saying like, oh, I never really intentionally made the decision to become top 16 world ranked robot dancer. Because people are not necessarily impressed by that. And I knew this. But somehow I, I learned something and that stuck with me. The more you try to become a machine, the more you learn how, what it means to be human. Why? Because you don't necessarily need to understand robots. It's very easy. You need to have isolated movements that are linear and then one after another. And that looks to humans like robots. And then you have a dime stop or you have a triple bounce stop. And that's it. Now, that is not what you study. What you study is to try to avoid everything within you that is human. You need to understand why you breathe, why you blink, and why your hands shake. Now, in a weird way, you become more human trying to be a machine. Now, however, I always failed in convincing people that I am a machine, and this is because you were an incredible scientist since you were little children. So when children see a robot dancer for the first time, and I tried this many times in the mall trying to get some money, they always go through the same three phases. And they work like this. First of all, there's just magic. And that is the moment where they truly believe that it is possible for a human to be a dead object. And they feel attracted by that and they get very excited, but somehow there is a reason within them 
that it's not very economic for them to be so excited. They have to leave that phase very soon. And that second phase is called curiosity, which means they need to take a closer look. Are you truly a robot? And even though they know nothing about robot dancing, they smell where's your biggest problem. They don't look at your hands that you worked on so much, or on your legs. They scan up and directly go to your eyes, and then they wait. They just wait for you to blink. And they're absolutely right, the eyes is the biggest problem. And then they start to move their hands. But why do they do this? Because they feel somehow, as little researchers, that it might be hard to hold the focus. And it's real, they're absolutely right. It's very difficult to just stare through things and not catch focus. And if this still doesn't work, they start to touch. They want to disrupt the magic that they initially fell in love with. And as soon as they see that you breathe, or even worse, blink, is the moment that they know there is no magic. And that is the third phase, the road of depression. They start to walk away because they believe, well, that is just another adult who pretends that he's magical for money. Now, you don't need to feel pity for them because what you see here is a full cycle because it's immanent to us forever to believe in magic. They believe in Santa Claus, but they find out through curiosity that there's a correlation of daddy never being present when Santa Claus is present. And then they're disappointed, and that hurts. They have their first love and their first kiss, and that feels so magical, it might last forever, but it doesn't. While growing up, we go millions of times through this circle till we become adults, and then there is no magic left. But that is also not true because it has nothing to do. Again, it's immanent to us forever to believe. Because no matter what's your age, if you have walked in the last 2,000 years through a, a valley in China that looks like this, all of us went on our knees and started to cry and, and, and pray. Simply because this thing is so beautiful, it cannot be, it cannot be real. It must be magical. But then again, we found out through our curiosity that it's just minerals interacting with each other. And now we don't pray anymore, we take selfies. You see that black field of magic getting smaller and smaller as we know more and more. And we have little reasons to pray, but what is that last thing in there, that last god on planet Earth that we can't recreate with machines? Well, it might be you. It might be humans that we don't really fully understand. And it's true that somehow in their cognitive ability of having 80 billion neurons interacting with each other, as the size of the Milky Way, there's something happening in there that is so magical that we believe within the field of humanism that there must be something in there that we can't grasp. Now, I came to this and this idea to investigate what actually makes humans by, by a piece I once did in Vietnam with those young, young people, and I always felt they were perfect. My career was already descending as a dancer, and I got more weight, and I couldn't hold so much power anymore, and they just looked perfect. But not only in their bodies, but in the responsibility they took on an early age. They, they basically danced in order to feed their whole family of 10 people on the streets since they were 12. And that's how your body then looks. They were just perfect in every sense. But if you were able to project true perfection on them, they became little boys. Somehow the machine is a microscope into human nature and not the other way around. Today I would like to investigate what actually makes us human and to see if they can truly persist. Well, it might be the trilogy of those three thoughts. First of all, we, we know about ourselves that we exist, and then from within we create a choice. Well, we believe machines can't do this to create their own choices, and whenever our choices that are expressed in space as artifacts deviate from the expectation, then we call this a creation. We call this person then to be creative because he generated a new thought. Now, today I would like to see if machines can do so too. The first one is the self, and we actually stumbled into this research by investigating this algorithm. Now, a lot of people think that this is just object detection. There's a sentence written by a machine learning algorithm after seeing this set of pixels. But I do believe it's not. It's like synthetic understanding. Why? Because the mathematical idea of understanding is compression, a zip container. If you go home today saying, I saw a robot dancer speaking about AI from Walt's Binaire, then this is very intelligent. 
Why? Because you now receive gigabyte of information storming into your eyes and into your ears, and you just do whoop, this. You sum it all up. And that force is so strong as we know nothing in the universe when it comes to the compression algorithm of your ability. But all of a sudden, this algorithm sees two million pixels and does whoop and gets it to the point. It's just a skier. And we thought, well, we need to investigate now what that machine is looking at now that it fully understands somehow. And we showed it some photography. It says, well, it's a man riding a bike, and it's completely true. And if you show it abstract art, it shows, well, it says weird things somehow, but what do we know about what's in that image? Or this one here is my favorite, as it completely makes sense <laughs> that that must be a baseball player. Then we thought, well, that's funny, but it's not really poetic. We need to continue somehow. Let's show it the Rorschach test. And if you also believe that this is a close-up of a bird on a tree, like our algorithm, then the possibility that you're psychological sick is by 82%. <laughs> and we found this joke um, like a half year before the MIT found this. Um, and we thought it's really not really funny. It's just a short thing, but it has no poetic depth. Um, that was my mistake. Why? Because MIT called it the first AI psychopath, and his name was Norman, and it completely went viral. Now, yeah, lesson learned. However, um, we thought the poetic problem is that who cares what that machine is looking at? We need to invert the question and say, what are you continuously looking at, yet you never fully understand? And we thought maybe you continuously look at yourself and yet you don't know what it is. It is that one thing that you have problems really verbalizing what it is. So we thought, let's rebuild this. Let's build a naked computer, a motherboard, and gave it a camera so it can look into the world. But unfortunately, it's standing right in front of a mirror, so the only thing it can forever talk about or investigate is itself. And then on the back of it, we have a little monitor where we can see where this machine is currently looking at, and who he thinks he is. He because his name is Narcissus. Now, why is that so important? I do believe that consciousness and self-awareness has been the mother of all inventions. It must have been roughly about 100,000 years ago that we thought, oop, I exist. It must have came out of nothing. And from that moment on, we must have thought, well, now that I know that I exist, I know that I don't like this, so I design my environment. And then I must have thought, well, now that I can design my environment, I can't do it by myself, so I have to communicate to others. But I can't say everything that I want, so I start to dance, sing, and paint. Everything was invented after this one moment. However, also all ugliness and all narcissism.
No, um, if I would be allowed to speak only once, I would have said this. However, we're super happy, but there's a problem with this project, and this is its exclusive nature. It's somehow for students drinking wine while thinking about Descartes. And we thought maybe we need to be more aggressive to really communicate with as many people as possible what's the challenges of um, machine learning towards our own identity. Now, um, is that the time that is left or that I already spoke? Thank you. Now, choice is way more aggressive to, than the self. Why? Because if I would take away the choice, well, it's hard to tell. Imagine, in, in Western society, we believe in choice. For instance, the UK just chose out of um, Britain, and no one understands why, but we have to do so. We just measure a lot of choices, and that is our new king and our new god. We follow without questioning, because everyone said so. Choice is actually the power of humans in general. But let's, let me give another decision. You are creatives, but if others would be able to predict what you think next and what you would do next, then no one would pay you. Or let's take a very personal one. If someone tells you that he or she loves you, then it only feels good if they had a choice in the first place and still picked you. Now, somehow the value of love does not seem to be in love. It is in someone picked you. However, if we could only prove that there is no one picking anything or no one having, ever having a true choice, that thing would collapse. Now, imagine there's a lot of plastic gloves and I would be able to predict which plastic glove is your favorite. Then that means that you don't have an isolated cycle in which you make your own decisions. It would mean I can basically infiltrate it and you don't have any possibility to make a different opinion. Now, I'm not able to predict what you think next, or what's your favorite glove, but that can have two reasons. It's a re receiver and a sender problem. First of all, it might be that you have that isolated circle and you can generate your own decisions and choose what you do, or I'm just not a very good observer, not a good judge. Maybe I don't see clearly, and you are very easily predictable. Now, let's take a look at the predictability or, and the prediction qualities of humans. Well, this right here is a sequence, and if you think that this is what happens next, you're absolutely right. Now, take a look at this sequence, which appears to be a little bit more complex. And now try to predict what happens next. And if you think that this is what happens next, you're again absolutely right. Now try to predict this part. Is there anyone that wants to predict what happens next? See, yes? This one on the top? Hey, someone has to give you a drink or something. I have shown this to probably 10,000 people and you're number two. Um, still, it holds because 99.9 has been outperformed right now. Normally, no one predicts what happens next. This was truly crazy. However, what, what, you, what you have to understand here is the, the following thing. Um, you think that it got more complex because it visually appeared to you more complex. But it, the nature of a complexity is not defined by how it appears to you, but its underlying code. That is its nature. And I coded this thing, and it's only the same code. It always looked different to you. The circle was always there. It was hidden between left and right. Then it blew up, and you feel like, oh, it's a watch. And then I distorted the watch, and all of you, except you, were out of, outperformed. However, what you have to understand is that machines never saw the cycle. They don't need the cycle. They can easily predict what happens next. And I would like to, therefore, this is crazy, investigate what about those little circles. Um, Imagine they're also just distorted circles, and they don't have any choice what they're going to do next. They're just automata, and they're programmed to go their way. It's just that we are not good observers. But what is about the most complex cycle that we know? This one right here. Do you believe it is possible to predict what this person is going to do next? And I would argue, yes, absolutely, especially when they try to keep up with machines. They reduce the complexity of their behavior, they become machines, and they will get swallowed by machines. 
That is a narration that is 100 years ago, and I do believe we will experience the same in the digital age, but not with its physical abilities, but with our cognitive abilities. And that is what our project Five Seconds is about. This is a mirror in that case for humans, but it's attached with a neural network that's in front of it and a camera. And it's a network of three different networks combined, and they together make an estimate. So you basically see your hands waving, but not in that moment. You basically see your own future directly, what you're gonna do in five seconds. Now you say, well, if I see what I'm gonna do in five seconds, I can still do the opposite. Well, then you change the future. But get me, get, get me right here, there is, no, <laughs> yeah. there is no model about the future. Yes, it's scientifically quite difficult to estimate what you're gonna do next. But the art part comes later. The reason why it will work is because you won't do the opposite. Imagine the following, we see someone at a museum and this is exhibited and he works by and he says, well, here, here it goes, I can do whatever it takes. And he says, well, it doesn't really work. He always sees something different. He will go away and he will stop playing and he will continue to brush that museum. And whenever he passes by for the next three months, that machine will already be three meters ahead. It's because we don't make the decision to make unique choices will be the reason why we will be predictable and then we have no choice anymore. But what about creativity? Now, that is actually my business. Now, someone could easily argue why is that guy from Walt's Binair now speaking about philosophy? I would like to showcase the easy connection here why that is so necessary. We work a lot with machine learning and what we see in there is highly alarming very often and I would like to invite a lot of people to design within this field and take control how we would like to have that future. For instance, I like when I get paid at my studio and my colleagues hang out with me. And then we are very happy that we are allowed to do work for great clients. And if machines could do that work too, then I can still philosophize with my friends how creative we are, but we won't get paid anymore. Then I have a lot of time to think about myself. And that is how the industry and philosophy is connected. Now, for creativity, I do believe one of the threatening forces is called gun. It's that technology that is able to show you those deep fake technologies, so an alternative version of Obama, let's say. And I would like to showcase real quick why this technology will, will probably succeed in its core concept. And it works like this, it's two different networks competing with each other, and you probably know this concept. It's a teacher AI and a student AI. Now the teacher gets to see data, let's say data of human faces, and then ask the student, could you also create an image? And the student says, well, here you go. The teacher says, that's not very good, uh, try again. And he tries again for millions of times. And after a while he comes up with something like this, nearly by ex accident, completely random. And the machine says, well, that looks kind of better. Continue that direction. And the student says, well, then here we go. And then we take away all this combination, all this communication, all that data, and only ask the student, could you please say what you have learned in that valley of understanding? And it says, well, this is what I learned. Now, the scary part about this technology and why this has to be clearly understood, what that means is this is its own network and it has never seen a human face. And it now generates 30 times a second human faces. Now, um, can this also predict the future? Well, yes, of course. For instance, you can take it in an image and ask, can you please go into your latent space of possibilities and show me if you find and if you are able to produce this face. For instance, this face. Now, I was never in that data set as well as Jon Snow but it knows a way that between the two of us. That means, who is in that network if I'm there and Jon Snow is in there? Well, all of you and your ancestors and your children. It has already stored the faces of all your children and they have no copyright. That's a scientific fact since 2017. What does that mean? How is that possible? Well, because this thing never stored data, it stored the intelligence of how a human looks between here and there. And if you also are protective parents that make Instagram selfies with their children and then pixelate their faces, you have to understand that no one needs those faces anymore. We can predict them and the data is well good enough in order to continue. Now, what does that mean concerning fashion industry? 
This stuff here has never been designed. It has never been photographed. Those models were never alive. Seven, now this is 30 times a second, probably a whole shooting for 50,000 euro a day that were poured into our creative industry are now not there anymore. What does that mean for visual communication? Well, we downloaded actually all of our friends, roughly 80,000 images, and tried to analyze what they're gonna do. And this is here what we call a love letter and a threat. Because in this network is no one that we don't appreciate. That is partners that we are high fans of, such as our friends from field. We want to know if we get color maps out there that make sense. Now, if we can do this, and most of those companies try to attract partners like Nike, we can generate color maps and put them back on who they try to attract by creating their own corporate design. And then we have, again, that sneaker 30 times a second. So what you see here is a big chance, but for who? And we need to design this together. Now, what does that mean? We could easily just sell, actually, whole networks of understanding well, a network of understanding how we could basically design generatively where on the planet and then sell products. Well, is that a design studio? Not really. Is that a PR agency? Not really. Is that outperforming at the same time a trend casting company? Of course, easily. All of them. Now, what does it mean concerning 3D? Well, 3D is a little bit more difficult because 3D is one dimension harder than 2D. So in 2D, a network has to make a decision about 1 million pixels, X and Y 1000. If you add a third dimension with the same resolution, you have 1 billion decisions, and that is the amount of distance that we still have to go there. But we found a little custom solution in our network that goes like this. We press the third dimension, push it into the network, ask for an alternative version, and then blow it up again. Now, we found this solution actually working with human bodies. What you see here is a data set of 60,000 different human bodies in poses. And then we taught this network and asked the student, could you please show us what you learned after three days? And this is how it looks. And in philosophy, this is called the unified whole, the idea that the human has to belong together. For instance, if my arm is here, and then all of a sudden back there in the room disconnected from me, then it doesn't belong to me anymore. It's not me. However, this is somehow connected and doesn't look like noise. So we thought, let's continue to teach. And after three more days, it looks like this. Please remember, this machine has never seen a human being, movements or anything like that. that magic of that weird travesty 30 years later, I felt like that is quite close. We didn't saw that coming. We are very far from, well, I just imagined this to be somehow quicksilver animation. No way we thought that this thing would all of a sudden invent dancing by itself by walking through the latent space of different pose possibilities. It is completely insane. And however, at the same time, we knew we got way more than just dancing or sculptures. So this is actually the learning process mapped over to the final body. We thought, well, this is not only really dancing, this is space, a network that thinks about space and is now ready to recreate whatever we see in that space. For instance, we could simply record everything humans has ever done within the field of sculptures. And then don't ask about all the things we have done with sculptures but ask about all the things we also will do with sculptures. Because that is not a network that learns what we have done, but about the nature of what humans like to do. Now, we are currently... <laughs> We are currently building the first sculptures in marble in Italy because we want to really print this in stone and we found a little pieta in there and we want to see how this comes alive and that is a super exciting time for us. Now, 
This part here is also very important to me, um, simply for the reason, as I give talks about interdisciplinary research between designers and scientists and all kinds of creative input, looking at the same perspective, I often, had, um, I often have observed that I'm often the last one speaking, while everyone at the business or political conference already has a wine. They already made that nice business, and with my deep voice, I make them chill before they hang out. That is what, because they don't take us serious. That's the fact. It's not a big business, it's not interesting. But that changes with that network right here, because this is not my opinion that we as creatives are a true power to actually research with an artificial intelligence. That's not my own opinion, it's a numerical proof outperforming all scientific standards by a whole dimension. That means this is a code that not Google's marketing department would like to have, that's their scientific department that doesn't know how that works. It's NVIDIA, Tesla, Volkswagen, no one in China and no one in the US that knows how it goes. And I can give you a little hint, you need to be good at graphical design. There's a trick in there, and that's it. Now, that is how depression feels, because who cares, actually, that you are able to think about yourself if your cho choices that you create are actually predictable and don't seem to be very creative 30 times a second. Well, I think we found a little hint what could be, again, somehow magical by trying this here. We wanted to investigate how children paint um, uh, their memories, their space, and how they express themselves. And then use a machine in order to, well, have an augmented reality app and looking through their vision, saying we pointed at the streets and we see little cars passing by. We could have an access to, to a totally Dadaistic world, the way only children express themselves. So we taught it as many, um, we, we downloaded as many um, expressions of children and then taught our machine. And after five days, it was then trained and we then asked it, could you please look at this image and paint it the way children would paint it? And this is how it looks. Now, with any statistical method, you have to understand that it's implemented in order to make a decision. Should I invest into this or into that? with 0.8 probability into this. Thank you. That is what a statistical method like machine learning is for. Now, if we apply this to vision and visual qualities and then ask it, please paint this, and this comes out, then something has failed. Because what is the color this network chose here? It chose rainbow, every color. That is the absence of decision making and additional glitches. Now, it doesn't work with that landscape. And what's very interesting is that it fails on a global scale, creating one gradient. But if you see those little squares, that means it also fails on every kernel size. It cannot make sense of details, and it can't make sense of it all. Right? And I do believe um, that says something about us, because we are able to outperform humans that optimize themselves children just fail to optimize themselves because their new agenda is to always see the new and create the new and feel the new. They are only out for true magic. So it is possible to recreate Pablo Picasso again 50, 60 times a second. It's not that difficult but because Pablo Picasso has optimized themselves and that we can recreate his corporate design is only because he offered a corporate design. Now, that says something about our favorite artist, because what is actually they want to express? What is it? Let's take a look at the subject. Well, it's every subject. Let's take a look at the color. It's every color. And the spacing, it's every spacing. We then ask the machine, um, how do they paint? And it's, they say, well, everything. And what does that mean concerning this mirror of the future? Well, um, I think Charlie Chaplin knew that quite perfectly. You have to deviate and you have to enrich your behavior again. And then we will ask that machine, what will Charlie Chaplin now do? And it will say, well, everything. Now, what does it mean concerning the machine that now looks into the mirror? Um, we had great success with this project and we are super proud of this project. We were receiving standing ovations at the United Nations and I was never expecting to go there and still it was the wrong it was the wrong um, response. Most of the time I hear when will this machine ever understand who it is 
I'm like, always, who cares? It's a machine. That's not the question. You know, we didn't build this project for two years, tearing it down because it was wrong, rebuilding it again, trying to discuss, to see what it truly is and how we can narrow down this narration, then book the most expensive crematorium in the world and ask the Balanescu Quartet from Pina Bausch to play mother for us, only to have that gigantic feeling sitting in a crematorium when that machine finally comes up with a decision, I'm just a bunch of electronics sitting in a table. Imagine the Berlin hipster sitting around, wow, how that feels. That is not what that piece is about. It was always a mirror, just a motherboard and a mirror. And that mirror was always built for us, a place where we can get together and now discuss well, who are you? And then find out, well, maybe we don't necessarily like now what we see. We are seeing that we are racists. We are seeing that we are less creative than we thought. We are seeing that we are actually those humans dancing the robot. And I might argue that we will lose that battle, but we can use that mirror in order to see it clearly and then fully understand, then deviate and enrich our behavior again. And that would lead, probably, to new magic. Thank you so much. You know, any questions, maybe? Because I think I'm five minutes early. Don't compress it, leave it like this. Thank you so much. A question about the children. Yeah. Because you, you claim your, your gallon going from seven children, and if you had chosen going from one child, do you see it emerging? Some kind of optimization or mm -hmm. um, it's, it's quite It's quite difficult to get those little children to 40,000 images. <laughs> um, but it might be an investment. No, um, it's, it's very difficult, and I wouldn't say it's forever impossible to do children images. I think by now we would probably know some ways. It's not safe forever, but if you're interested, um, I could demonstrate, because normally, for instance, in business or in political environments, most people say, um, should we now all lead our company like children? And they're right, because children are not very effective, but I could um, maybe speak real through, with quick through a solution because that was not a solution. Um, the solution could be like the following, and this is what we are currently working on. It's called the Annual Redundancy Report. Now imagine that every decision, let's say in visual communication, is just one dimensional. That means between white and black. And then we see that here is black and then there's white. Now Vera from Field just got famous for picking a specific gray tone and then hits on Instagram like crazy. We see that they have 20,000 followers and then we know that is the trend, right? Now what the problem is that one image and one artist cannot generate enough data for us to recreate that gray tone. What we need is more data. And you know where we get them from? We get them from young students. Because what they will do as soon as field hits the right gray tone, they will come to a norm and try to simulate that gray tone. Not necessarily because they are copycats, but because they are young students trying to have a career too and look up to their role models. And that is when they all come together, thousands of them, creating the same gray tone. And that leads to a density, what we call in sociology, the emergent norm. It's such a high density of the same gray tone that all of a sudden the machine sees clear. And we would like to, and that is one dimensional, and we can do this on three million dimensions. Now imagine we could do the following, we could give away our trend uh, gun for free on a homepage where you can see what's the average designer currently doing. Now imagine you are then two young students at a art school and you say like, well look at your stuff, it looks like the annual redundancy report. What would we do as creatives? Well we would deviate. We only need to see and understand how redundant our actions are, and we could then enrich them again if we offer humans a mirror. Yeah. That would be a solution. Thank you very much.